What were some of the studies that kind of boosted your confidence or, or got you interested in this? Or, I mean, those are two kind of separate questions. Yeah, I mean, the two main points that to me said this is doable, as well as being the only way to really be aging, is that one is this plasticity, these cases in humans that show that functions as complicated as language mm. can move seamlessly from one part of the brain to another. So that means that progressive replacement should be possible. The other reason why is all these studies, you know, in the last uh, five to 10 years, actually, yeah, five to 10 years, showing that if you put in these immature brain precursors or immature brain stem cells, they give rise to nerve cells or neurons that do remarkably well in terms of connecting to the rest of the brain. They respond to sensory input. If you put them in the visual cortex and, and excite like a mouse's eyes, they'll respond just like neighboring cells. You can put them in a motor cortex and excite them and they'll cause movement. So they're connecting relatively normally. So those two things, this, this tremendous, the, the plastic nature of the neocortex in particular, but, but the brain in general, combined with the ability of these immature precursors to form functional cells together, to me, I said that, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but we can do this. And it's not going to be easy because we need to reassemble all the cells in the right structure. But that's just a technical issue that we should be able to Yeah, and that's actually a great point because I kind of derailed us while I was asking you about what you're working on near term uh, after the first one. So, so what are the other uh, two things that you're working on near term? I was just thinking of that too. It's like, I never <laughs> um, Yeah, the other two things are to look at the extent of projections in larger brains. So all our studies so far have been in mice. And before we're allowed to do this in humans, we have to show that the cells that the, the new neurons that are derived from our graphs can connect over longer distances. Because in a mouse, we see that our cells connect all the way to the spinal cord. Fantastic. But that's like only a centimeter in distance, right? It's, it's not that far. So we have to show that this can also work in larger brains. Because in a human, we're now talking like at least uh, a foot. You know, yeah. Or, or, so, so are, is there like an intermediate brain that you're using? Are you, are you going to do this on monkeys or? Yeah, exactly. We, okay. we, we kind of have to use monkeys, unfortunately, which I'm not happy about, but again, they won't let us do this in people until we show it in monkeys. So, and the other one is a much more well, uh, how, 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 how far are you on the monkeys? Like, have you, have you done anything there? We've done not with ours, but just with what other people are working on, we've done some preliminary tests in terms of working out the surgical procedures. So we also have different components to this experiment. We need to know when our tissue is differentiated well enough that it can be used for a task appropriate for the location in the brain where we put the graph. And for that, we need to monitor, it, monitor the graph maturation with an electrode. So we're, we're testing these things in mice first. And we also have this neat trick where we can silence specifically the graft tissue transiently. And this is the most important part of the experiment because that will allow us to prove that it's the electrophysiological activity of the graft that's underlying the acquired function. Because what, when we silence the graft and the, the animal is no longer able to perform the task and then we reactivate the graph and it's able to perform the task again, that'll be pretty clear that it's the activity of zones. So, so like that tissue still functions, but you kind of just silence the electrical activity in there? Yeah, exactly. Just the electrical activity. It's How do you do that? Symbolically happy and, and alive and everything. It just can't fire action potentials. How does that uh, technically work? Like, how do you silence that? So there's this really nice tools that have been developed again, fairly recently in neuroscience that where you have these channels that you can express in neurons 
And you can either shine light on those channels to cause the neuron to stay in an inactivatable state or to activate it. So different channels do different things. And this is called optogenetics because the <laughs> channels are genetically encoded in the, or genetically expressed in the neurons. And then you can use light to activate them or, or inhibit those neurons from firing. And you can do the same instead of with light with small chemical inducers, and, and that's called chemogenetics. And uh, it's basically the same idea, though you can control the activity of the neurons that way. Um, and, and that's what we're looking at doing.